Ukraine has reportedly deployed three brigades to cross the Dnipro, but how far can they get without armor support? I'm Paul, U.S. Army combat veteran. It's November 17th, 2023. This is your daily Ukraine update. Let's get right into it. Okay, first, taking a look at the combat map, there's a couple of updates to the front lines, all of which are fairly minor. The first of which is in the north, reportedly uh, Russian forces having some success in and around Yadhine. You can see here, uh, while a few areas are, oh, 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 that's sorry, uh, you can see a few areas are Ukrainian advances, particularly in this ridge line here and up to this forested region. You can see a number of other areas, Russian forces have made advancements, uh, getting just the smallest tip of this forested area here near Ivanka. Uh, but all in all, again, as we talk about the north, I don't want to dismiss it entirely, but the chances of a stunning breakthrough are not that great, right? You see Yadhine and Ivan Ivanivka uh, are within 500 meters of each other. Uh, I, 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 When I see these sort of minor movements, it indicates to me that these are probably company or, or, or some light battalion-sized elements that are engaging this fighting, uh, and it's probably not indicative of any kind of larger uh, likely breakthrough. Now, there's also been some adjustments near this area uh, near Shumi. Uh, this is south, well south of Bakhmut, um, a fairly, uh, an area where there's been very little fighting, uh, and they're describing these as adjustments, where initially they had Russian forces controlling this uh, foothold of forested area uh, to the east of this river, but in fact, Russian forces actually hold uh, forested areas uh, much to the east of that. Um, this seems like a correction, the way they're framing it, and the fact that it's been kind of not really a site of any major Russian combat action. Um, and of course, there's reports that the fighting continues near Avdivka. You can see here, there's some slight increase uh, Russian forces trying to push here in central Avdivka towards this forested area and a very small marginal advance of just it looks like about 150 meters uh, down this forested area uh, he here and while it's advancing south it is technically constraining Ukraine's ability to use some of these roadways this is a Russian advance in a in a in a, in the direction Russia desires, but is it really part? Is it it is it is it is moving in the right direction, but it is an absolutely glacial pace for the rate of casualties that Russia is reportedly taking in and around Avdivka. So. I wouldn't put a lot of stock in any of these advances as being indicative of anything other than kind of the ebb and flow of the war as we've seen so far. And when we look at the combat map, you can see the same thing plays out. Russian forces attacking in areas where, frankly, uh, 62 combat engagements, you guys can predict where they're taking place. Verbova, outside of Volodar, near Donetsk City, uh, Avdivka, Bakhmut, interestingly, no reported attacks here, which again, to me, just validates that there's it, while there's changes in territory around this um, uh, Kharkiv region, there's not really significant operational changes. These are small tactical advances done by small groups of troops. Now, here's where things get more interesting. When we look at the news surrounding the Dnipro, you can see that at least some rumors, and file this in your rumor mill, um, that that Ukraine is actually sending three brigades across the Dnipro. Now, obviously, they're not all going to cross at once, right? But this is still a huge logistic and operational challenge. Um, and a, a brigade is generally a few thousand troops. So we're talking probably between six and 10,000 troops crossing the Dnipro. This is a huge force, uh, a far cry from the company-sized elements that Russia had been reporting that they're dealing with. So it's going from, uh, for those of you doing the math at home, uh, it's going from a reportedly, you know, three to 500 up to six to 10,000. So 10xing the, um, reported Ukrainian operational force. Now, are all of them going to deploy across the um, river at once? No, it's probably going to be a, a substantial uh, transfer over time, but the um, 
Guardian, a fairly well-known uh, newspaper in the UK, has said that three brigades have established a position across the Dnipro that the Russians are unable to dislodge. But it's unclear, they said, how much U armor the Ukrainian military is able to get across the river. As we've seen, they seem to be relying on these ferries that can carry very limited armor. And so despite the success of holding, taking and holding the village of Krinky, officials expect that Ukraine will only achieve gradual progress, liberating, quote, one village at a time. Um, the same assessment, though, is reporting that Ukraine's counteroffensive in Zaporizhia has culminated. And one official saying neither side is capable of mounting a decisive operation on land. Um, of course, obviously, all this fighting is taking place on land, but they mean they need to reach into the amphibious assault playbook in order to try to break this stalemate. Um, a source added that a prolonged conflict would follow in which long-term military assistance from the United States and Europe are likely to play a crucial role. Officials said that Russia has suffered losses ranging from three to 400,000 persons. Remember, losses includes both KIA and WIA. So I actually think that's probably broadly within the within at least the scale of correctness based on other reports that we've seen. Um, heaviest battles near Avdivka is costing Russia between 500 and 1,000 casualties per day. So the original article, of course, comes from the uh, a channel called The New Voice of Ukraine. So probably a pro-Ukrainian channel. But here's the thing. I think it, 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 you can trust a pro-Ukrainian channel to report true things about the Ukrainian military. Um, you know, can you trust them to report accurate battlefield assessments and, and the outcomes of battles? Probably not. But the, a pro-Ukraine channel is going to have the best news sources to what's happening in Ukraine, just like in some ways the pro-Russian channels oftentimes have the best insight and earliest insight into operational changes within the Russian military. Guys, if you're interested in supporting veteran-owned companies and companies that make their products right here in the USA, you want to check out Strike Gum. This is my company that uh, I was inspired uh, or rather uh, it, uh, when I was in Afghanistan, I needed a source of caffeine when I was on patrols. And the only thing available to me was these disgusting energy drinks. Uh, they were carbonated. They were loaded with sugar. They made me feel gross. And if you've ever taken, tried to drink an energy drink when it's 115 degrees out, it is a revolting experience. So to solve it, I created Strike Gum. Strike Gum is the zero sugar five calorie energy drink alternative that it has 90 milligrams of caffeine in every single piece just so this is as much as a red bull or an amp energy in one little piece and unlike red bull or amp energy we don't have any sugar it's a refreshing mint flavor so your breath won't smell gross and best of all there's five of these in a pack you throw them in your pocket you have the caffeine of five energy drinks in your pocket in your gym bag uh so it's going to keep you going uh, all day. It'll keep you going for five for for a week from a single pack. So check us out at strikegum.com. We've got a sale going on on the trays. If you're somebody who's a heavy energy drink user, you know they're like five bucks a pop. Uh, the tray has 75 pieces, the equivalent of 75 energy drinks. It works out to like 68 cents a piece. So I would definitely check it out, strikegum.com. And best of all, 50% of the profits from this first production run, I'm donating to charities that support Ukrainian civilians who have been injured or displaced in the conflict. So if you want to support Ukraine and frankly get just the better caffeine delivery vehicle, uh, check us out, strikegum.com. Okay, the only other news, there's not, what I find interesting is actually that the, the, um, Institute for the Study of War is not talking about this Ukrainian offensive. And that's probably because Ukraine is keeping things pretty tight-lipped. Uh, official stances on this river crossing have been very limited. But here's what I thought was really interesting. Vladimir Putin has awarded prominent Russian mill blogger, who at one point was critical of Russia's military performance during the invasion, of the Order of Merit of the Fatherland Second Class. And it's the founder of Rybar. Guys, if you've been following this war, you know Rybar is the pro-Russian map update uh, channel. It's it's basically the best window here in the English language space into the Russian belief about what's going on and their perspective, um, especially on a tactical and operational level. Um, other Russian mill bloggers, of course, congratulating the founder, Mikhail Zinivchuk, um, and uh, he's already been recruited by the Kremlin uh, to a working group on mobilization problems, 
probably as a as a, as ISW assess, assesses uh, an attempt to gain some level of control over what he says to his Russian domestic audience. Rybar has 1.2 million followers on Telegram, um, and it was originally a personal blog until uh, Prigozhin began to sponsor the channel, and then with Prigozhin's uh, untimely passing. Um, Right, the Rybar has returned to independence. So, really interesting. Uh, a really interesting way that Putin is trying to g- sort of carrot and stick his mill blogger community, where he's both uh, imprisoning uh, creators like Igor Gherkin while simultaneously rewarding creators like Rybar. Basically, trying to say, hey, if you get with the program, there are rewards, and if you don't get with the program, there are punishments. Uh, unfortunately, because I am an honest mill blogger, sadly, I have yet to receive any awards from any government um, other than, of course, the U.S. military, and frankly, they haven't given me any thanks in 10 years. So uh, that's fine. I'm critical of them too. Uh, anyway, thank you guys so much. Hit subscribe, uh, hit like, tell the YouTube algorithm I make good content, and check us out at combatvetnews.com. A huge thank you to the colonel tier members of combatvetnews.com. Huge thank you to the lieutenant tier members, and a huge thank you to all the members of combatvetnews.com. I couldn't do this without you. Thank you so much. See you in the next one.